So Dr. Fonseca, you know, we've talked about um, all of a lot of these different sort of therapies, but there are newer ones that I think patients and caregivers know even less about. And uh, these are really for relapsed refractory. So, you know, second line and, and after um, people who are looking for those other options. And I know you have a lot of experience in this. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on this. Um, so let's break these down. Let's start with Selenexer or Expovio, uh, known in a drug class called Selective Inhibitor of Nuclear Export. So more jargon there, but I'd like to ask you, what is the mechanism of action there, AKA, in layman's terms, how does it work? Sure, sure, sure. Before I do that, let me just put a very quick comment for that first relapse. You know, we're using a lot of the, the drugs that we mentioned during frontline. So for most patients during the first relapse, they're gonna see one of the antibodies, something like either daratumumab or sarclisa, which is the other monoclonal antibody, you know, is a toximab. And then they, that may be combined either with you know, IMIDs or, or with carfilzomib. And there's a, a large number of clinical trials that are being, you know, uh, published and presented for this. So a lot of what I'm going to say relates more to that second relapse, more than the first one. And that's where a lot of these molecules would, would come into, into play. So we can start with, you know, with Selinex or so Selinexor is a very interesting molecule. It's fascinating. It turns out that the, the cell nucleus of any cell has a little pump that gets out proteins that are going to be interfering like with the, the division process of the cell and the transcription of genes. Now, these proteins, you can think of them like chaperones. They don't want to let things happen inside the nucleus. So, so, but the cells sometimes need to get them out because if a cell needs to divide, then they don't need some of those proteins. These proteins, we know them otherwise as tumor suppressor genes. And, and the reason they're important is because if those proteins fail, then the, the cell can become cancer as well. It turns out this, this proteins also, you know, could interfere with the whole process of, of cell death. So if you get them out of the nucleus, you could enhance, you know, some of the, some of the activities of other drugs, but sometimes using it of itself. And that's what cell inexor does. So it, it blocks that pump. So it makes the cell more vulnerable. And, and in doing so, then the cell is more likely to, to die. So we're seeing this both in combination with uh, corticosteroids with dexamethasone, but also in combination with other drugs. You know, it has been, has been tested and it turns out to be successful. It was a large phase three trial that was first presented at ASCO last, last year. It's called the Boston trial, where uh, Selenex are added to bortezomib and dexamethasone showed benefit. Now, uh, I, I don't use it a lot in combination with the bortezomib, um, but for patients who have advanced disease and for whom we're looking for another option, this is one of them. Um, you know, I, I combine it a lot with, with uh, carfilzomib, which is the other protosome inhibitor. And we've learned a lot about this because Selinexor was, I, I would say this was like the horse that, you know, stumbled at the start gate. It, it started first being used twice per week, and it was associated with pretty severe gastrointestinal toxicity and anorexia. But since we have learned more about it, we use it now on a once per week basis with very good coverage with antiemetics. And actually patients are doing okay. Uh, so this is one of the drugs, again, that, that has been used. Now, for me, the bigger question will be, is there a future somehow where something like this could be used uh, perhaps at the lower dose as part even of combinations earlier on. And, and the one thing I, I think a lot about this, you know, could this be something like dexamethasone? Dexamethasone enhances every other treatment that we use in multiple myeloma. So maybe dexamethasone plus some Selinex or, you know, future clinical trials might be the way to go. I don't know. We need to see clinical trial data for that, of course. Uh, but it's nice to know that it works and there's a proof of principle for it. You know, I, I think it's really interesting that you talk about this, and I want to give more context to people who are just learning about Selenexer and how it works and how it was received. We talked to you, Dr. Fonseca, back in 2019, first with uh, Selenexer's um, first approval, and that was for a very specific patient um, who'd been through the ringer, right? You, you alluded to it earlier. So this was someone who had gone through at least four prior therapies, whose disease was refractory to at least two proteasome inhibitors, two IMIDs and at least one um, anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. I mean, it's a lot to talk about and I just was reading about that earlier. Um, so again, these patients didn't have a lot of options. And then the last approval uh, for the relapse refractory adult patient for multiple, my multiple myeloma was in December, this last December, and it was for uh, relapse refractory adult patients who'd gotten at least one prior therapy. So again, as you described, 
it's very different. So when you're talking about sort of the uh, evolution of the use of novel agents, um, you know, is there anything else you can you can describe when it comes to uh, what you've learned and how important it is to figure out the dosing and schedule? Sure. No, 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 that's that's critically important. So the Boston trial allowed one to three prior lines of therapy, and that's why it was approved as such with a, with a package insert. Um, however, I, I think where, where I see it coming into play, it's going to be more in that second relapse and later. And the reason for that is the first relapse seems to be pretty well covered by some of the most active combinations. There's, you know, the Candor study, which was uh, carfilzomib, the aratumumab, the Ikema study, which was Zetoximab and carfilzomib. And then we have Apollo and Pollux, which are daratumumab with an imid that is with POM and, and, and with LEN. So I think most people are going to stick for that first relapse, but it's really important to note the following. You put your best foot forward from the beginning for the treatment of multiple myeloma. We have uh, published, we published last year a paper that we show a high degree of attrition with lines of therapy, uh, such that you should not save good drugs for later. So, you know, you do your frontline treatment and you do transplant. If you do that plus maintenance, okay, you got one. Then that first relapse, you, you have to go with, with a good combination. And that's where potentially something like, uh, uh, you know, protosome inhibitor and, and an antibody would come into play. But then if you do that, then what, me, what it means is that you could be seeing again, you know, uh, progression-free survival of greater than two years after that first relapse. So you need to have options that would be in the next line of therapy. And I think that's a situation where something like Selly could come into play. And there's, you know, we're going to talk about other options as well, too. Uh, but but the reason I say this is because you should not hold back. So give the best treatments up front, knowing that there's going to be options down the line. It's great that we can even talk about that, that there are these options. Um, so before we move on to the other options, and we'll be covering them all, is with the Selenexer, you talked about the dosing and side effects, of course, is something, again, that patients and caregivers, we hear time and time again, this is incredibly important. Um, so what are those um, side effects with Selenexer, um, especially as you know, the field has learned more with uh, different dosing and different schedules? The main side effect has been gastrointestinal. There is some myelosuppression. Uh, the myelosuppression is important that one needs to monitor, particularly platelets. But I mean, the reality is many clinical trials show that. So I don't think that's in it of itself, a showstopper. The, the, the major difficulty was with gastrointestinal toxicity, and that came in the form of nausea, vomiting, and lack of appetite. Now, the toxicity was much worse when we used to use Selinexor on a twice per week schedule. In the Boston trial, it's been uh, uh, changed, so now it's used at the once a week uh, schedule. And I can tell you what I do, most of the patients that I start on treatment, as I mentioned, I combine it with something like carfilzomib. It can be combined with pomalotomide or daratumumab, but I combine it with carfilzomib. I usually start at 80 milligrams, 80 milligrams once a week. And I use a triple antiemetic regimen. And what I mean by that is I usually start with something like, you know, ondazetron just before the, the first dose, and then use it every six hours for a couple of days. Most patients we put on a lansapine, five milligrams at nighttime, plus the dexamethasone they get. Uh, you can, you know, um, um, improve that with the other antiemetics, the NK inhibitors, in particular, the Ruby is the one that can be used, but you don't have to do that from the get-go. But this is a medicine that you just don't prescribe and then let go and say, we'll see you next month. We have our nursing team call and monitor patients. And if need be, they can be supported with IV fluids or changes in doses or change in the antiemetic, as I mentioned. Uh, but if you're able to get through the beginning, then, then you, you know, you can be successful. And again, I, I, I think this provides a new option for patients who would otherwise be very limited in, 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 in what to do next. Melflufen is a new formulation, um, and, um, more intelligent formulation, if you may, to, the, to deliver alkylating agents. We know alkylators work well in myeloma. We know that both from oral melflan, we know because that's what we use in the transplant and so forth. Um, and the idea is that, uh, you know, it can be uh, uh, used a bit more uh, in a more specific fashion because of aminopeptidases in our body that would make it be more prominent and more effective against the, the, the myeloma cells. Uh, we are just seeing the start of it. Um, you know, we had the Horizon clinical trials that show, you know, efficacy and that led to, to its approval. I mean, the real question is what is the future for this particularly in combination? Um, I can tell you, I, I, I have a patient who has essentially, you know, exhausted all possibilities and 
for a number of reasons, the patient has not been able to go into clinical trials. So, you know, we have looked at that recently as an option uh, for him. And, and, and we know that alkylators can, can, can work even in heavily treated patients. There's a, there's a pretty uh, funny and famous story about a patient who lived here in the United States and, um, you know, had exhausted all possibilities. So she went back to Spain to see her family as kind of you know, one, one last event in her life. She was originally from Spain and she was sent to, to Dr. San Miguel. And San Miguel looked at her record and, she, and he said, oh, the patient has never gotten Melflan. So let's try Melflan. And lo and behold, she responded very nicely to Melflan. And the funny part of the story is that immediately she starts calling the United States and say, hey, hey, there's this new drug. It's called Melflan. We should be using it for the treatment of myeloma. And, and it brings color to the conversation, but it's a good reminder that alkylators, such as we now see with melflufen, which has to be given intravenously, it's used like an intravenous uh, medication, uh, oh, you know, just opens a new door for the treatment of myeloma. With the uh, melflufen, would also love to talk about um, those side effects, the known side effects, and how patients and caregivers may be able to help um, manage manage them. Mm -hmm. You know, we, with melflufen, we are, um, um, you know, paying a lot of attention, of course, to blood counts. Uh, myelosuppression is the biggest thing. As it's possible with alkylators, you can have some GI toxicity, but it's not as prominent. So I think myelosuppression is a big thing. And that, of course, is something we need to monitor because many of these patients have received extensive prior treatment. I don't think we have a medical term for this, but the bone marrow just becomes fatigue. It just gives out, right? So we have patients who have so much prior treatment that, uh, you know, their ability to produce enough platelets and white cells, et cetera, becomes compromised. So that's just something to monitor. Uh, we have tools to support that. And for the right person who has, you know, extensive involvement of the bone marrow, this may be something that ultimately as the disease gets under better control can help with those counts as well. Wonderful. And then the, the third one I'd love to explore with you is the Belantamab mafodotin. <laughs> I hope I didn't butcher it too much there. Um, but yeah, could you describe that mechanism of action, aka how that one works? Yeah, so this is this is a very interesting drug. As a single agent, has one of the highest uh, levels of activity against multiple myeloma, and it's a BCMA antibody that is conjugated with a warhead, which is a mafodotin, which is a tubulin disruptor. And what it does, it sort of, uh, you know, gets binds to the myeloma cells, gets internalized, and then that releases the mafodotin. And so it, it belong, you know, belongs to kind of a, a, like a Trojan horse approach category of drugs that we use for the treatment of, of cancers. Um, it's, it's, again, proven to be very effective. It works in multiple uh, prior lines of therapy treated patients. So, it, you know, it can work in pretty advanced myeloma. Uh, and, and of course, now it's been explored in combination with other agents. Um, I mean, that's a natural thing we do, of course, right? Something works and we start combining it and we try to move it forward. Um, there's a very unique and peculiar toxicity with, uh, with this particular drug, and that is corneal toxicity. Uh, and, and it's not completely understood, but something that happens and, and has been described with other similar agents in oncology is that patients can develop um, uh, inflammation of the foremost part of the eye, what we call the cornea. So they develop this keratopathy. And, and this could present itself in many ways. There could be changes in visual acuity, uh, but in the more extreme situation, there could be some, you know, uh, uh, just poor tolerance to, to bright lights, what we call photophobia, or just the discomfort and pain that comes with that. Now, this is reversible. Uh, but obviously, it's an important toxicity because then and it will take some time before it co all comes back to normal. So when it was approved, they came with a requirement that patients be evaluated prior to every infusion by someone who's either an optometrist or an ophthalmologist that can do a thorough assessment for the person and, you know, provide information to the treating oncologist about the, the, the you know, their ability to proceed forward or not with that. So it comes with that REMS uh, plan and, you know, people need to get certified to know how to use this. Uh, but again, this is something that would be uh, more efficacious than uh, potentially that naked antibody. So those antibodies, meaning without a warhead. Um, my hope is that as, as we continue to use it, we learn better ways to do it in a way that is not toxic to patients. And, and that's really the history of every single myeloma drug. We started with thalidomide, 800 milligrams you know, lenalidomide, we changed that dexamethasone, we cut back bortezomib, we went from IV twice a week to subcutaneous once a week, carfilzomib once a week. So there's got to be a magic way that we can find so that we can use more of this uh, important drug. 
Yeah, it's so interesting because it's the first time I'm hearing of this kind of toxicity or side effect, if you will. Um, and it, you know, if I'm coming in and my doctor's telling me, you know, you may have problems with your eyes, um, it should be reversible. Um, you know, it's again a little bit overwhelming. I guess my question is to clarify you were talking about an optometrist or an ophthalmologist being involved. Is that what happens still with the patients um, if they're going to be on, on this, you know, uh, this treatment? Yeah, it, it is a requirement for our prescribing of it that they, they, they are engaged for, you know, for each one of those infusions. I think it's fair to say too, because, because of what the toxicity is that, you know, there, there's uh, naturally some reluctance sometimes by patients of saying, you know, boy, my, my vision, but um, you know, for, for some individuals, for the right individuals, it's going to be a good treatment. People are spacing it out. I think that's probably the number one thing that is being done. And, um, you know, if it works and, and you don't happen to get it, which by the way, the majority of people don't get it. I mean, it's, it's a, there's a, um, you know, sizable minority that gets it, but there's, there's a, a smaller minority that gets a more serious version of this. So you don't want to be in that group. But the reality is most people actually do pretty well. So, so, so that's kind of the context of what you need, you know, to consider in regards to getting the treatment or not. Okay. So what I'm hearing is it is a, you know, small population that gets this severe reaction, um, but that everyone, of course, at least you can speak to your care at your, at Mayo Clinic um, is observed very closely uh, with all, with all the different agents, not just this one. That is um, you know, my last question about this is, you know, with these different sort of paths people can take, how do you determine, you know, this is an iteration of an earlier question about the first line or primary therapies. Um, how do you weigh which one, one patient should try versus, versus another? Oh, that's a $64,000 question, right? Because a lot of this depends on prior treatment and patient preference and, uh, uh our, our life becomes somewhat complicated as we walk patients through the decision-making process. So it takes a, you know, a nuanced conversation and discussion with patients as far as, you know, what their preferences are and what to do next. Um, and, and I would say that the main conversation so far has been between the, you know, Balantamab, Mafadotin and Selinexor, but of course now with Melflufen that comes into the, into play. And I think a lot of this will, will, you know, prove itself as more clinical trials are reported with, you know, with combinations of these agents. But right now our life is complicated as far as all of what we need to do and discuss. When there are so many options, it just takes more studies. And okay. of course you called it artisanal. I mean, you know, doctors, oncologists are having to make these calls themselves too. And with your own experience. So I understand that's part of the equation. 